very. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of. Hi everyone. Hi. We're just going to begin. Thank you. Um, just wanted to welcome you to um, this lecture this evening by our speaker, Professor Garcia. And um, actually, Ben is going to do a much more thorough welcome. I'm just uh, welcome you on behalf of Queer Asia. And if you've made it this far into the program, we're really thrilled you're still here. And this promises to be a very, a very exciting lecture. And we've, we're thrilled that you can join us. Thank you so much. Um, so we've at Queer Asia, we're a platform um, that focuses on focuses on LGBTQI issues um, in Asia and um, among Asian diasporas. We just had a two and a half day conference here. Um, this is our final event. And after that, we have a closing party, which we, um, which you're all welcome to join us at. Uh, we also have a film festival, uh, which is run from the 24th to the 29th. So our final day is tomorrow at the British Museum. And uh, all day tomorrow is free and open to all to attend. So please do join us there if you can. Um, if you want to tweet us, yes. our hashtag is hashtag QueerAsia2018, um, and I will hand over to Ben. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, welcome to this event. It's a, a, a joint event, so Queer Asia definitely, but I should also say the Centre of Southeast Asian Studies here at SOAS is, um, is also sponsoring this event. Um, and I guess... For me, sort of, Neil Garcia, I guess we can say he's a big hitter both in queer studies and in Southeast Asian studies. And that's why it's nice that these, these two sponsorships of the events and so on um, come together. So um, I met Neil 10 years ago, but very briefly, only for about half an hour at a conference because there were many other important people um, all wanting to speak to each other. But anyway, so it's very nice this evening that Neil is, is, is here. So Neil is a professor in comparative literature and creative writing at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and the director of the university's press there. As you'll undoubtedly know, he's the author of numerous um, poetry collections, works in literary and cultural criticism of literatures of the Philippines and so on. And so it really is a tremendous pleasure to have you here this evening, Neil. Um, we've got a two-hour booking. Um, but, you know, it's the end of a conference. I, I don't think we, we <laughs> will use as much of that as we need to use. So Neil's going to talk for around half an hour, 40 minutes, something like that. And then there'll be time for questions afterwards. Yes, yes. Okay. okay. So I think we'll show the trailer later, right? Just sure. hold it there. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll basically do the theory part. And then when we get to the film, just before that, we'll run the trailer. Okay. Uh, I'll sit down. Is that all right? There's a typo, I think, in the, in the printing of the program because there's a missing word. Uh, the complete title of the paper is Translational Desires, Performing Gender and Sexuality Studies in the Philippines. So there's a missing word called studies. It's not performing gender and sexuality per se, but the study of gender and sexuality. So it's a, a bit of a meta-criticism, in a way, in the beginning of it, where I'll talk about, where I'll reflect on what I've been doing. Okay. I've been doing gay theory and writing about Philippine gay culture for more than a quarter of a century now. My primary research topic having been almost from the very beginning about these fields of inquiry. What's important about this chronological reckoning isn't only the realization of all the important passages that gay and more recently LGBT life in the Philippines has undergone in the last two and a half decades, but also the fact that as my presentation with you tonight will hopefully unpack, I've pretty much written everything that I've written about this topic, not in my first language of Tagalog, but rather in my second language, which as with most Filipinos is English. What does it mean when we render opaque the cultural specificity of the language in which we have been inquiring and theorizing, especially when the location in which they occur and to which they pertain, they pertain is not monolingual or monocultural, but rather culturally hybrid, syncretic, and helplessly mixed? I'm interested hence in the question of interlinguality or translation and how it may prove critically generative to frame our inquiries into the specificities of LGBT critical and theoretical work in work in our in our and perhaps other locations in the globe from the perspective of how translational it all is. 
This is especially the case to the degree that, in many different places around the world, LGBT discourse is being conducted in the Anglophonic register, which of course merely reflects trends in technological and cultural globalization as a whole. I'm going to try to accomplish a few tasks in this lecture. First, I will attempt to describe the linguistic situation in the Philippines as translational, by which I mean that it is constitutively and interlingually mixed or hybrid. In pursuit of this idea, I will recur to my previous study of what may well be the earliest Philippine Anglophone novel about the male homosexual experience, Severino Montano's untitled, uh, unpublished opus, The Lion and the Fawn. So there's a, uh, actually not just a film, but also a novel in this paper. I will attempt in my reading to identify this novel's translational moments, if only to show the persistence of local, indeed quite possibly untranslatable meanings, despite or precisely because of the, the textual uniformity of their Anglophone surface. So you read the novel and you think, oh, everything's intelligible, it's in English, but there's so much that has been translated that actually did not completely translate and I will be able to show those. The interpretive, uh, this interpretive procedure then becomes the frame within which to resituate the conceptual issues and debates that I have been grappling with in the area of gender and sexuality studies. In brief, I will argue that what I have repeatedly called out as a moderately nativist position in the study of gender and sexuality in the post-colonial context is nothing if not another register of the critical position that recognizes the translational dynamic between local and translocal between oral and textual, traditional and modern conceptual histories. Central to these tasks is my contention, not exactly controversial in as much as it's almost an academic commonplace by now, that critical interventions, unlike literary or creative writing, are by definition supposed to be more self-reflexive, particularly in regard to their presuppositions. Thus, while Anglophone creative writers are not expected to be all that conscious that they are performing cultural translations when they write, this very same indulgence may not so readily be granted the critic or theorist, one of whose primary tasks is to examine his or her, her own logical premises when he or she writes. So there's that additional sort of complexity that I'm going to look at. When you're an Anglophone writer and you're writing creative works like novels, etc., you may not be that aware that you're translating. But if you're an Anglophone critic you, and you're supposed to be self-reflexive, then that should be somewhat assumed, right, that you should know that you're translating. And the problem is many of us who are writing criticism are still writing as though we are creative writers. <laughs> okay, so there's that. I will then proceed with the reading of a recent independent film about the Tibo or tomboy identity cited in a province in the southern Tagalog region of Quezon. Um, cited in actually a town in, in the province of Quezon. Being creative, this film cares little for theory and is almost autoethnographic in its representational project that's entirely grounded in the local language and its public understandings about gendered identities. Neorealist in approach, it traffics in the vernacular and local expressions mostly and has no wish to translate itself into the terms of global anglophonic activist discourse. The problem about um, translating in, in, I think, in the LGBT context is that if it's happening in the activist world, then um, uh, somehow that sort of creates uh, certain expectations. And so the terms of the language are actually predetermined, like LGBT, right? And the other terms actually have no right to circulate anymore. So there's that issue too. So it's a lot of things. Oh no. I will conclude by complicating the question of the critical difference that the idea of translation makes. I will briefly flag and take to task recent published attempts to do local gay, quote, and lesbian, quote, unquote, criticism in the Filipino language, which do self-consciously translate essentialist precepts and arguments from international, mostly American LGBT or queer studies, and yet do so without mediating or translating them critically or, or self-reflexively enough. Hence, we may call this transliteration rather than translation. So we've seen of late attempts to do LGBT theory in Filipino. And it's really ironic that they're the ones who are actually guilty of essentialism, which is <laughs> ironic, okay? Hence, while seemingly local and or homegrown, this form of local theorizing, because it does not question its own assumptions, ironically merely replicates the sexological universalisms that the nativizing gesture of writing resolutely in Filipino supposedly avoids. So it's a lot of different sort of give and take. 
In the Philippines, one of Americanization's most enduring effects is the socialization of Filipinos into modern modes of gender and sexual identity formation. This process was naturalized through a variety of biomedical Anglophone discourses, and it has resulted in the entrenchment of the homo logic in the increasingly sexually freighted lives of educated Filipinos. As we know, it's to this dynamic that the Philippines owes the reality of local gay and lesbian cultures. There are many encouraging narratives that the urban-based sexualization of Filipinos has engendered, and these are the narratives of cultural hybridity and translation, which may also be read as narratives of resistance. The perspective that inquires into the question of translation is different from cosmopolitanism, which I find tends to ally the issue of resistance by and large. So I'm actually not using post-colonial uh, uh, cosmopolitan theory, I'm going back to post-colonial theory. Okay? More specifically, we can say that these narratives include LGBT activism itself, which, as Filipinos practice it and despite appearances, is certainly not reducible to the same political thing that it arguably is elsewhere. While it was the arrival of sexological thinking that pathologized Filipino LGBTs in the first place, as the example of increasingly politicized Filipinos, gays, lesbians, and transgenders illust illustrates, all of those should be, high should be italicized because they sound like they're the same global thing, but they're not. It was precisely the stigma that enabled them. This is especially so because like modern heteronormativity itself, the stigma has needed to be translated to take effect. So even the stigma went through translation. We need to begin by reminding ourselves that English is a language that continues to occupy an ironic place in the lives of many Filipinos. Hence, to the degree that Philippine literature in English is translational, I'm bringing that idea of Philippine literature in English because the novel I'm going to talk about is in English. It cannot be simply representational or realistic. Realism is a signifying practice that presupposes a monocultural ground upon which the consensus of representational fidelity can happen. And yet much of the criticism of this literature has generally failed to take note of this cru crucial precondition and acting a category mistake with ruinous consequences. Because realism is a foundational compositional and critical concept, it only follows that the various literary practices encoded in Philippine Anglophone writing Thing, still need to be post-colonially specified, their translated or syncretic qualities critically recognized and unpacked. So one of the reasons why it's so difficult to think about Philippine writing literature in English as translational is that realism has been abused sort of naively as a category to describe it. How can it be realistic? You have novels by, a, let's say, a very well-known Filipino writer in NVM Gonzalez. He wrote about the lives of farmers, the Icaingeros and their children on the ash-covered loam of Mindoro Island. And they, they are all talking to each other in perfect English in the middle of the field. That is not realism, okay? But it's perceived as such in Philippine criticism. So that's the issue. The Philippines Anglophone tradition represents local realities by translating them, both in the technical and cultural senses of the word. If within a monocultural context, realism is already the translation from imitation to creation, then in the linguistically plural situations of post-colonial societies, this already fraught process of verbal mimesis can only even be more complex and confounding. As translational Philippine literature in English negotiates the plurality of cultural and linguistic registers and ideas of local realities and encodes them in slash as English. The critical task then is to post-colonially inter in, post interpret its seemingly self-evident themes, images, and gestures by translating them back into the specific conditions is, and situations that generated them. So you have to, to if you're a real sort of assiduous critic of this literature in English, you have to translate them from the English back to the specificity, right? Which is somewhat lost because the writer actually sacrificed all of that specificity to have a uniform surface that's anglophonic. In the Philippines, the most popular local term for the male homosexual, the pejorative bakla, started out as an ungendered, ungendered adjective to denote a state of confusion or fear. During the Spanish period, it slowly became synonymous with the local gender terms for womanish men, except that unlike the words that it eventually came to explit, to, ex to eclipse words for gender crossers generally, it carried with it the force of macho insult. 
With Americanization upon the arrival of the psychological style of reasoning that, among other things, implanted sexological categories, Bakla was slowly but securely homosexualized. So much so that it is now understood as a synonym for male homosexual, quote unquote. Although it, as it occurs in popular culture, it still mostly connotes the earlier ideas of effeminacy and even transgenderism. The Bakla is therefore at best a partially homosexualized identity, partially translated into this new discourse. Partial only because he, and not his love object, the real man, the tunay na lalaki, gets imputed with the orientation, despite their mutual indulgence in, in and enjoyment of what is technically homosexual sex. In this matrix, gender would appear to be partially yoked to a customary privileging of depth or coreness. In Filipino kalooban, external acts can be qualified to an extent by this interiority. I'll get back to that idea of interiority later. Now, I go now to the novel. Severino Montano, the author of the novel, posthumous, posthumously declared national artist, was the moving force in Philippine theater before and after the Second World War. His work in Philippine Anglophone theater was extensive and in terms of his staging innovations, undeniably significant. He wrote his novel well before his death in 1980. The Lion and the Fawn is a sprawling melodramatic story about an urbane and globally traveled theater director who practices psychotherapy and his tempestuous love affair with a much younger and behaviorally bisexual officer of the Philippine army. Written in English, the novel's text problematizes the sexual definitions of its main characters and uses the narrative pretext that the director who is the narrator is a psychoanalyst in order to achieve this otherwise dour expository project. So if you, want, if you want to write a novel in English, the very first one that will talk about homosexuality, you better turn your narrator into a psychoanalyst so he can explain all the, all the things that need to be explained about sexuality and it's supposed to be acceptable. <laughs> So it's actually a bad novel, badly written novel, but never mind. Needless to say, this fictive endeavor eventuates in the mooting of the local understandings of gender, namely that the bakla is homosexual while the real man he loves is not, and the novel adopts the Western essentialist perspective on the issue and basically declares them both as homosexuals. You understand that? So it completely uh, goes Western and says, oh, the real man and the bakla uh, are both homosexual. Yeah. Montano's attempt to displace prevailing categories and to translate the gender intransitive discourse of orientation into the local setting does not quite succeed. And this is where the translation obviously fails. On one hand, it's misogynistic subplot that demonizes women, especially the beloved's plain and uncultured wife, specifies its sexual politics as agonistic and peculiarly gender inflected. The officer is already a married man, and the, the novel uh, imputes all sorts of awful things to the poor wife, actually insults her like crazy. So it's very misogynistic, okay? On the other hand, despite the novel's textual insistence on, their comparably mas on the comparably masculine comportments of the two characters, as well as the mutuality of their same, same sexual desire, the material inequality between the genteel, well-off, and supremely cultured unmarried older man and the economically burdened and married younger one is tellingly familiar, for it calls to mind popular cultural representations of bakla love for the real man as financially transactional and therefore ultimately ultimately non-reciprocal. So it's supposed to tell a, a Western gay story, I mean, you know, that recognizable one with mutually loving gay individuals, but then you look at the story's plot and it's, it's actually very bakla. You know, the director is older with a lot of money, the, the beloved is younger, uh, who's behaviorally bisexual, who has no money, and so you understand. And then the novel is so misogynistic. Okay, so the politics is not sexual but gender. So it's very clearly a carryover from the local that is not getting successfully translated. Indeed, it's easy to see that in this story, the good director invests more in this so-called love between equals. It's so funny. So supposedly, we're, suppo we're supposed to believe that this love between the two is, is mutual. But every time we, we hear uh, the director saying that he loves uh, the officer, we hear it as dialogue. Every time we are presented the idea that the younger man loves the director, it's only reported, in the, reported indirectly in the narration. So it's obviously suffering from, from kind of a very similitude issue, right? Still in all, 
The text Cosmopolitan Project is gay affirmative. The word gay is mentioned only once, but it's enough to give the reader an awareness of this novel's political agenda. That Montano chooses to play down effeminacy and to focus instead on the gender intransitive aspect of male homosexuality can only be seen as a naive reaction on his part. Indeed, how can a novel about intramale affection set in the Philippines at this time not implicate the discourse and reality of effeminate homosexuality embodied most forcefully in the ubiquitous person of the bakla? How could Montano have even believed he could create a novelistic portrait of the Filipino gay man as masculine and non-bakla when he intended this very same portrait to be at least recognizably Filipino? So he, he wanted to exile the idea of the bakla from the novel, the bakla returns and haunts it in a very bonga way, a very crazy way, right? So you cannot do that, right? The translation will create, will have remaindered effects and the remaindered effects will haunt the translated text. And yes, like all the other mother tongues in the Philippines, Tagalog, the language of the world that this novel is set in, is gender neutral. While seemingly inconsequential to Philippine Anglophone criticism, the fact is that realistically, these local characters wouldn't have been a he or a she. Thus, gendering these characters' identities and lives from the Tagalog source to the English target is and can only be ironic to the degree that what the latter takes to be fundamentally binary is to the former, to all intents and purposes, unitary. An immense slippage takes place when one translates the pronoun sha, which is Tagalog, to either he or she. And we need to remember that. We're coming, I'm coming from a country whose 176 languages are not gendered in the pronominal sense. There's no he or she or him or her. There's only one pronoun to refer to a person. And yet, yet you write in English about that, that world and you have to choose a pronoun. That is an, an immense translational sort of fiction that you're making, you're producing. Hence, despite the anatomical dimorphism of modern biomedicine on which the homo hetero binary rests, and tr as translated into the Philippine linguistic context, this binary is far from coherent and simplistically assured. Montano's ignorance of this translational dynamic caused him to mistakenly believe that erotic equality can only be achieved in the superseding of the bakla identity, which is to say, its masculinist homosexualization. As we know, this is a project that can only fail, even as in this text it did generate interesting and mostly ruinous effects. So he tried to do it, and the text contains the failure of that translation. So the realist project in Anglophone writings, creative and critical, requires cross-cultural dialogue, a practice of double translation that involves both the representational movement across cultures and the transcultural movement across realities. As I have attempted to only briefly rehearse here, the post-colonial reclaiming of referential Anglophone literary texts by Filipinos requires tracing the trajectories of this double or hybrid movement with a view of proposing various modes of post-colonial resistance as made possible by the metonymic gap between mimesis and poesis that cleaves all translational acts, particularly as they involve the reading of seemingly simple and universal representations. The idea of cultural translation bids us to recognize that English in the Philippines is from the very beginning a contact or hybrid form of English, and thus a kind of creole, despite the sound of it. It may sound like it's not a Creole language, but it is. I'm talking to you in, I suppose, intelligible, universal-sounding English, but almost all of my references are actually very hybrid, and I cannot make all of those qualities present in English, okay? We must insist that this is the case even in the most subtly localized, which is to say, the most universal-sounding of circumstances. Grounded in an immemorial orality and permeated by a layering, layering of cultural differences, both Philippine literature and criticism in English are in many ways translational, transformed as they necessarily must be across oral and scriptural systems, as well as across speech varieties and forms. So there is a translation across languages, yes, but in the Philippines and I suspect other parts of Southeast Asia, the translation across oralities and literacies. Because we're working with, within cultures that are still, in many ways, residually oral. And oral, orality is not just um, a, uh, the absence of a script. It's, it's really a cognitive mode. And so there are those translations that take place, too, on that level. 
As such, they negotiate the plurality of cultural and linguistic registers and ideas uh, of the Philippine reality and transcode them in this globally plural and pluralizing medium. Suffice it to say that acknowledging the translational character of gender and sexuality studies in the Philippines will require the rejection of the universalist accounts of Western biomedicine, yes. However, such accounts unfortunately persist even in the writings of contemporary feminists and LGBT, LGBT thinkers in the Philippines, some of whom have been couching their work in Filipino. To my mind, this interlingual position primarily urges the adoption of a native, moderately nativist perspective on the issue. And if you've read my books, I've been talking about moderate nativism for a while now. That bids us to critique essentialism and consider the persistence of residual indigenous valuations of gender that modify, that is to say, syncretize the newly implanted sexual order. Indeed, we can say that in the Philippines today, bakla signifies a culturally hybrid or syncretic notion that incorporates both local and translocal conceptions of gender transitivity and homo or same sexuality. Thus, despite the modernizing ideologies of gender and sexuality, bakla continues to preserve within itself residues of its pre-homosexual past. For instance, the notion that bakabaklaan is simply a matter of confusion and indecisiveness, which are in the first place the oldest and even strictly genderless denotations of the word bakla. So there is within the concept of bakla still persisting now this difference that the translation into homosexual does not account for. And that is that bakla was started out as a word to refer to confusion or even fear and cowardice and things like that. So they are all there. When Filipinas keep saying bakla, they're not, they don't mean homosexual. They're bringing all of that history into that concept. The sexualization of the Philippines has, in other words, been far from unproblematic or complete, and thankfully so. We still have something to celebrate or beware, I don't know. <laughs> and local variations of gender have simply served to hybridize the newly implanted sexual order. Despite the popularly recognized fact that the bakla has sex with a, with a real man, for instance, among, still now up to now among rural and urban poor Filipinos, it is only the former who is legitimately homosexualized by the activity. In like manner, the category of bisexual, as it is used in the Philippines, doesn't strictly imp imply a bisexual object choice, but rather merely denominates a masculine identified gender presentation on the part of the fully fledged gay man. Yeah, so if you go to Grindr or you go to Planet uh, Romeo, or yeah, Planet Romeo, huh? Gay Romeo. G uh, yes, which used to be guys for men. Uh, you have Filipino men who call themselves bi, but they're actually not bi. They're just presenting themselves as masculine, identified, okay? And of course, along with that description that they're bi, it also says no chubs, no femmes, no. It's like a whole catalog of, of just insults, really. Okay. On the other hand, lesbian also tends to be exclusively conflated with the mannish identity of the tibo or the tomboy. So you understand the genderizing of sexuality is a, an instance of translation, okay? What the stubborn genderization of concepts of sexuality tells us is that the sexualization of Filipinas, while increasing and expanding in its virulence, has thus far not been uniform. Okay, examining this process more closely, we can in fact see that it has in fact often been skewed toward the further stigmatizing of what had already been an undesirable because minoritized identity of the bakla. So there is, okay, if the bakla is now going to bear all the burden of this new discourse of sexuality, it means an additional burden to the burden already of being effeminate or, or identified with, femin uh, with femininity. By the same token, we may also say that our local articulations of the gay and or transgender identity do not simply repeat the colonially inflicted stigma of homosexuality as an immorality and or an illness, for they can only be vitally informed by and mixed with earlier and more, more local conceptions. In other words, they do, do not only signify exclusively private and sexual concerns. They may also be seen as instances of post-colonial difference as translational sites. This form of resistance isn't volitional, but but inheres in the structure of colonial domination itself, which is always already interlingual in its operationality. 
The gay and now transgender identities as Filipinos have increasingly come to view, understand, live, and champion them, are as much the descriptions of these histories of cross-gender behavior and homosexuality as the expressions of the very syncretic freedoms and desires that, are, that these self-same histories have paradoxically conferred. So I think a contemporary gay man actually have translational desires. Their desires also evince that sort of interlinguality and that sort of mixedness that, that, that's part of their reality. And so the arrival into the Philippines of LGBT discourse and its attendant identity effects will not amount to a complete supersession of its cultures existing categories for gendered personhood, but will simply demonstrate the same kind of translation that any other Western concept necessarily undergoes the moment it finds currency thereabouts. This is especially true for a, for a residually oral country like the Philippines, in which the categorical mentality of modernity has not fully taken root. What this means is that narratives of kabaklaan remain and will continue to remain as a common ground across the gay, quote-unquote, bisexual, quote-unquote, and male-to-female, transgender, quote-unquote, identities that must now increasingly emerge from the new global discourse of LGBT politics. Okay. Now, a film that we'll talk about uh, uh, the film next, but before that, I'll mention another film, which I'm, I'm not sure if you've heard of. It's called Die Beautiful. Has anyone heard of it? You should have invited that film here. It's quite amazing, but I'll mention it now. Evidence of the persistence of the local in this translational exchange abound in the neorealist and found stories about the bakla and the tomboy or tibo in Philippine independent cinema. Easily, we can invoke the recently acclaimed film by June Lana titled Die Beautiful, in which the category bakla completely eclipses the politically correct and in the film entirely non-operative category of transgender and is restored to its empirical and semantic capaciousness, embracing the Filipino urban folk spectrum of identities and affects, from gradations of the feminine identified to the unremittingly and brutally macho. So in the film, you have the wor no mention of the word transgender, even if the main characters are actually full-fledged, quote-unquote, transgender Filipino men. Um, and the word bakla is what they use to understand, to, for, to call themselves, but it's also the word being used to refer to masculine identified gay men. And also to fag hags, who are also bakla. So bakla is this word that is operating throughout the film to embrace this plurality of realities and the activist discourse of LGBT politics is nowhere to be found at all in the film. And that was deliberate on the filmmaker's part. It's also, I think, empirically more accurate because the LGBT terms are circulating in academe and among very limited sort of like circumstances only. By and large, in popular culture, they don't operate at all. Gay operates, lesbian operates, but then LGBT as a coalitional identity and the politics that it betokens, very, very uh, tenuous existence in Philippine popular culture. Now we will talk about Ned's project, and I suppose we can play it. So another film that's rooted in lo local nomenclature is Lemuel Lorca's Ned's project judged as the best picture in the Cinema Filipino Film Festival of 2015. It stars the multi-awarded Anjali Bayani, who plays the role of a Tibo, Tagalog slang for tomboy, under another localized Anglophone word that loosely connotes a masculine-identified genital female, okay, and resident tattoo artist of her hometown, Sampaloc, Quezon. So it takes place in, in, in the Quezon province, the southern, uh, south of Manila. It's hard not to sit back and take serious notice of Lor Lorca's latest film, since even in the new uh, wave indie movement, the lesbian topic has not been treated all that often nor all that earnestly. So we've seen a slew of wonderful uh, gay films and uh, tra transgender films, but not enough lesbian films. So this one, when it showed, it was a big cause for celebration because at, le at last we had another good lesbian film. Ned is the pet name of Hemedina, and her project in this story is, interestingly enough, a baby-making one. After being dumped by her straight and faithless girlfriend, and after witnessing the slow decrepitude illness and death of her friend and Tibo mentor Max, she decides she doesn't want to suffer the solitary and lonely fate that her conservative older sister keeps warning her about, and so, so sets out on an all-too-awkward quest to promptly get herself pregnant.
This leads her to consider going against her own nature, quote unquote, and having sex with the more likable members of her mostly male and liquor, gu liquor guzzling barcada, or click. Uh, a tricycle driver in one instance and a flamingly sissy and ribald beautician in another. She succeeds with neither, initially at least. So she actually, because she likes getting drunk, and she's a tattoo artist, and her, her, her closest friends are all these sort of drunks, including a, a, a beautician, sort of bakla drunk, and so she forces them to have sex with her, okay? Well, not forces, she urges them, and they give in. And so, yes, it's that kind of movie, <laughs> and it's that kind of world that Ned moves around in, rural, lower class, and not especially educated, and regularly inebriated. Of course, cinematically, this is bound to be familiar and interesting territory, in, and indeed, convincingly and memorably recreating it is one of Lorca's clearest accomplishments in this charming and altogether memorable film. Nonetheless, we need to disabuse ourselves at this point and remark that these foregoing anglophone sentences of mine do not quite capture an essential feature of this world whose language, Tagalog, like all the other mother tongues in the Philippines, is not predominantly gendered. As I previously mentioned in my unpacking of Montano's text, while seemingly inconsequential to the Anglophone discourses in which discussions and or debates about Filipino culture are typically institutionally couched, the fact that neither Ned nor the other characters in this world as, as address themselves as she or he is far from unimportant, but is already, especially in this kind of film, the weighty crux of the matter. This is why calling Ned homosexual or even lesbian, while easy and ordinary enough in urbane, cosmopolitan, and academic as well as activist discussions such as what we're about to have, must remain problematic, as the film poignantly shows. As illustrated by many similarly themed popular culture texts, the homosexualization of the Philippines, Bakla, and Tibo identities remains incomplete, inasmuch as in such mundane and uncritical accounts, they alone bear the onus of this label, and their partners and or objects of affection do not, under do not understand themselves as sharing not in the least, this orientation. Like Ned's girlfriend, the one who leaves her in the beginning, never got sort of called Tibo. She was never implicated in, in, in that sort of reality. It's only Ned, okay? By contrast, the very idea of sexual orientation presupposes a kind of erotic self-sufficiency. Self within the homo and hetero divides, something not true of the bakla and the tomboy or tibo, mistakenly cast as homosexual in this unconsciously translational model, who are generally understood as being slavishly fascinated with the lalaki and the babae, or the man and the woman, into whose hands they are popularly depicted as being all too willing to commend all their dignity, if not their ready cash. This is not to say, of course, that just because Bakla and Tibo are not so much about sexuality as about gender, then these local identities no longer suffer from the inflictions of heteronormativity. To the contrary, and as a matter of fact, they are entirely defined by it, as Ned's finally acceding to the reproductive imperative so tragic comically exemplifies. Although we can easily add here that what we can easily add here is that this plot point isn't entirely earned or realized, come to think of it. Her fears of growing old, and alone aside, the urgent maternality of Ned's interior life is simply not present enough in the film. So the reason that she wants to get pregnant is that she doesn't want to grow old alone. I mean, that's a little shallow, and the film could have succeeded better in trying to show us a greater portion of her inner life that would have made that kind of decision more inevitable or more, more fictionally acceptable. Nonetheless, we need to remark that all over the world there may not be one, but many heteronormativities. This is my addition in the theory debate. I don't think we're facing one heteronormativity, really. We have to pluralize it, and maybe we should pluralize everything else, like homosexualities, you know, heterosexualities, heteronormativities, right? And what perhaps distinguishes the local one is that, or the Philippine one, is that unlike modernity's discursively rationalized and biomedically defined heterosexual matrix, to a certain extent, 
Local electoral normativity in the Philippines permits of non-alignment between genital sex and gender identity precisely because its male-female dualism remains oral and customary rather than textually and therefore categorically absolute. Because it's still a residually oral culture, the categories of gender in that heteronormative sense, male and female, are customary. They are not as scripturally absolute as in the West, which has been literate for how many centuries and which has more or less in, uh, created so much literacy around this dimorphism of male-female. I was at the British Museum yesterday, and there was a guided tour, and we were being told about the central dome that had housed how many... My, hundreds of thousands of miles of books. In the Philippines, everything that's done in Philippine studies by Filipinas will fit in a room like this one. We are underwritten, yeah, up to now. Unwritten, untheorized, oral. Much of it. Okay, so there is that, I think, lack of categorical commitment, really, to genitality. It can be, what? Revised. <laughs> it can be diluted. Okay? In contrast to the West, in the Philippines, a man can be woman hearted. That's an expression we use a lot. Pusum babae, that man is the heart of a woman. And the heart of a woman is an organ, it is a physical thing. Okay? And a woman can be man hearted. And as such, going by this form of pre-modern and in many ways eminently negotiable heteronormativity, the objects of desire must only be the lalaki and the babae, or the man and the woman, respectively. So it's heteronormative, but then we have to understand it as a different kind of heteronormativity. It has an orality to it that's not very different from the heteronormativity that Judith Butler had wonderfully unpacked. The matrix that she had described so powerfully, right? That matrix is translated in the Philippines. And in translating it, it has come to be oralized. Okay? Of course, the cultural simultaneity of everyday Philippine reality bids us to remember what, that a variety of cultural modes, as well as technologies and knowledge systems, can and do coexist in pretty much in the same way that in so many Philippine cities and the shanties of the poor can and do blissfully coexist practically, practically side by side with the mansions of the rich. So we have to be careful about this reading that I'm making because they are very westernized, very obeying, very cosmopolitan, educated, utterly sort of like literate Filipinos and their houses sort of coexist with the shanties. Okay? Obvious, obvious, obviously there are many exceptions hereabouts to any kind of social dogma and misalliances do conceivably happen as this film's uncharacteristic and fairy tale turn toward the melodramatic affect affecting the enacts. She finds another girl, love object, who's from the city, who's very literate, who never re who speaks in English now and then, but never drops the word homosexual or lesbian. Okay? And there, you see that misalliance, that sort of different knowledge systems of two people in the Philippines, and they're finding a common ground in the experience of tattooing, right? Which is part of the, maybe the charm of the film. It's all about inscriptions on the skin. And, and that's another kind of literacy, which I have no time to get into, because I have two versions of the paper. The one that's long, I'm not reading. That one talks about the tattoo, and I won't do that anymore. Just as the baby dreaming Ned decides to enter, she enters a contest in this film called Tibo Tibo Tiba Tiba, loosely, meaning, loosely translated as The Dyke Takes It All. It's a fictional regional talent contest for masculine looking Tibos, obviously inspired by a recent spate of similarly themed shows on national television. So into this world of Ned enters the Manila-raised, urbane, well-off, and obviously troubled Ashley, an androgynous-looking mestiza, or half-mixed-race dance instructor, played by the Eurasian actor Maxine Eigenman, whose multiple tattoos mark her out as a rebel and misfit, and whose friendship and romance with our mannish heroine introduces a critical and translocal difference into this resolutely local world. By film's end, Ashley confesses to Ned that she has finally made the decision to accept herself, whatever that means since the word lesbian doesn't get dropped in this film at all, and to come out to her aghast and easily offended upper middle class family. While the film ends just at this moment, with Ned looking capaciously pregnant, so Ned's project works, she gets knocked up, 
Thanks to a night of binge drinking with her tricycle driver, driver friends, we are encouraged to believe that the relationship between Ned and Ashley will possibly revise the traditional Tibo Babae or tomboy real woman model toward a more mutually complementary one between adult gynephilic and genitally female equals. So there is that modernity trajectory that's being sort of introduced towards the end of the film. This is actually simply the tomboy or tibo equivalent of the many bakla films we've seen of late that basically tell the same culturally transitional and modernizing story of increasing homosexualization as manifested in the dramatic movement away from the customary romantic and hierarchical model to the modern and egalitarian one between two mutually loving individuals whose desires are now at, at last symmetrical and comparable with one another. It's a romance. All of these gay film and lesbian filmmakers are entering this romance mode of bringing in what Montana failed to do in the 1950s. Okay, now they're trying to make it happen. And I think it is happening to a certain extent. Okay, what's different here is that Ned the Tibet remains mannish and in this sense gender transitive while in many recent indie gay films in the Philippines the Baklas newly achieved erotic self-sufficiency necessitates a masculine self-identification and presentation. So Ned's project is slightly better because the local is still there in the end Ned does not turn into a lipstick lesbian she remains butch, or quote-unquote, mannish. No? In the many gay, uh, gay films, the bakla has to turn butch. All right, so there's that. Going by this contemporary vision, the modern bakla can now love other gay men precisely because they are now all gender intransitive, which is to say similarly and often hyperbolically male, sometimes too much. Okay. Obviously, despite the seeming progression, a symbolic heteronorm holds sway in either case, still and all. So again, that heteronormativity, which we have to localize, it's still in, 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 in these new texts. Okay. Now, I will skip the part where I talk about Filipino attempts, um, uh, attempts in the Philippines to, to do theory in, in Filipino. Because I basically just bitch in this section. Uh, most of these attempts are so strange. They are merely transliterating the uh, foreign words, the English words, like heteronormativity becomes heteronormativa something, they do that kind of translated, and there's no attempt to mediate the theory at all. Ironically, it's the Anglophone critics like moi and others here who are really painstakingly trying to pay attention to translation and to all these different sort of la slippages, whereas the theorizing by Filipinos in the Philippines, in Filipino, hasn't reached that point yet. And also, maybe I need to say this, they don't refer to our works at all. They have, I, I think, dismissed us as colonial-minded, as though what they're doing is actually better. It's so much worse, because we're just transliterating the concepts. So there's that sort of ironic, funny thing happening in, in LGBT discourse in the Philippines. But it goes both ways, the thought. And this is where I'm going to take to task the Anglophone critics. Okay, I'm not going to name his name, but you probably will recognize him, some of you here. The fault goes both ways. So the fault in the Filipino attempt is clear. They're transliterating, not translating. They're merely just coming up with local sounding versions of these essentialist concepts, and they're not even mediating the concepts. Okay. The recent recourse in Philippine Anglophone queer criticism to difficult and deconstructive ontological theory Hontology, we've all heard of that. It's the in thing now. In order to register the pertinacity of bakla locality in the face of gay globality need not even be necessary if only the question of translation, which always already recognizes semantic excess and the impossibility of equivalence, were made central to the analysis. In other words, in the regime of the globalized Filipino gay, the bakla will, of course, forever haunt the scene because it is nothing if not the ground of the former's possibility. The ingeniousness of this kind of local queer criticism is that its invoking of ontology becomes possible because it decides to exile the bakla, an unnecessary thing to do, in the first place. 
so it, it now there's this ontology of how this new globality we are forgetting the bakla and now it's haunting us again but they were the ones who decided to exile it to begin with it's always been there do you understand how clever that is right okay no names but he knows who he is this kind of oversight is unique to, uh, uh, to Anglophone criticism, which by and large has also not been alive enough to the translational dynamic that conditions it, thereby suggesting certain class-specific overdeterminations. There is that to work with, right? I think if we're addressing the bakla in Manila, the middle class bakla, it's so easy to not be that sensitive, right, to these translational problems. Right? But if we actually are probably sited in a more rural location, then probably this will be absolutely clear to you. Okay? Hence, at least to the credit of those doing theoretical work in Filipino, the category of kabaklaan may not need to be abandoned at all, seeing as how it cannot be entirely superseded in one hand and is a powerful discourse that's certain to persist and inform whatever else they can throw at it on the other. We've been throwing all sorts of things at bakla, like everything from the kitchen sink to the toilet bowl, and it has not budged. It's still there. And so I think I... I praise the ones working in Filipino anyway because they're always working within the word bakla. Okay? Okay, last paragraph and I'm done. <laughs> While the translatedness of LGBT critical and political discursivities in the Philippines is something that Filipino LGBTs themselves may not be conscious about, it nonetheless makes sense to suggest that they should study this cultural transformation more self-consciously if only to have some say in its possible directions and deployments. Unless we are more self-aware about what we're doing when we translate, when we do perform cultural translation, then we may not be able to control where this discourse goes. Do you understand? In other words, a little more mindfulness, a little more sort of rootedness, okay? But at the same time, a commitment to some kind of openness as well. So thank you. That's the end of my paper. And thank you for your patience. Neil, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'm sure we have questions. Um, so if you have questions, um, if you can first of all say who you are and then ask your question. I'm sure there's one. No there. questions, wow. It's, or it's when I'm meant to ask the question, isn't it? So, so I'm going to try and ask you to take this beyond the Philippines. You're the language person here. Yeah. So. so I'm going to ask you to take this beyond the Philippines. So you're, you're well aware of what everyone's writing about with respect to Thailand and, and Indonesia. And, and Not entirely. But you're, you're, you're vaguely aware of vaguely it. Vaguely aware, yes. Can you see what how what you've been talking about with respect to the Philippines and, and, and the problems that you've got there, which is quite... I mean, the Philippines it's is unique, much more English I think. speaking. But, but can you see that these issues are going on elsewhere when, when we're talking... When I think even, on one hand, even probably more severely, but on the other hand, probably not as bad. Meaning there's a paradox there. English has, uh, 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 the Philippines has uh, more than a century of Anglophone literature and uh, more than a century of Anglophone criticism. English is universally spoken and understood uh, north to south of the country, but that English is our English and it's Creole. Meaning it sounds intelligible, it sounds like it's universal sounding and can be uh, easily sort of uh, understood, but there's so much translation that's taking place. Right, uh, I I've been to Thailand and I I know the queer uh, the the ones doing LGBT work there uh, within the Soji sort of um, network sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression activist network. We all know each other from the Asia-Pacific region. That was where we met, Asia-Pacific Queer. That's sort of one network. Um, everyone delivers their papers in English, no matter which area of, of Asia they come from. And I think this is the first, I mean, I myself was uh, sort of unwittingly doing that until I realized, hey, you know, what I, well, I turned 
old. And my university gave me a medal for teaching 25 years. And so, um, and then I got invited to talk. And then I said, I've been doing this for 25 years. I thought to myself, I've written almost exclusively in English. What might that imply? So it became an occasion that, that sort of like a uh, chronological marker in my own career, an occasion to reflect on what I had been doing. And I realized that um, this is one way to rethink what I have written actually up until that point. No? Uh, but I, yes, you're right. I think that in many ways, um, uh, uh, translate this issue of cultural translation must be taken more seriously and self-consciously uh, by everyone doing Anglophone uh, activist and, and critical and theoretical work in any country in the world, actually, not just in my country or not just in Southeast Asia, right? If English is a medium of analysis, then you have to be aware of what that's doing to what you're analyzing and whether what you're analyzing is actually entirely capturable in English and whether those things you're not capturing are the important things, right? You probably have to remember. I mean, just very simply, the pronominal system, the absence of a binary pronominal system in our language, it changes a lot of things. It's possible, therefore, for the Shah to actually have a little more sort of of the other, Right? Because the Shah is unitary. There's a, an, a, there's a unitariness to the concept of the person. And there is blindness about gender distinction, in a way. So it's, and we've seen that in the anthropology and under anthropological studies, that in fact the gender system, at least in our part of, of Southeast Asia, really stress unity rather than duality, you know, in many ways. Yeah. The way they people dress, the way people, uh, uh, performed rituals, things like that. You know, it's, it's a carryover, right? But of course, colonialism happened. We have been dualized, right? But the oral persists, and you have these these sort of proof, the evidence you see in the identity of the bakla and and the, uh, the tibo, you know, in the Philippines. And I think that might explain also the katui, maybe that might explain um, uh, the manambali or or or. Uh, What's the the one in Bugis, the Bugis identity? Bisu. The Waya, okay, the Bisu, you know, those things. Study the language, see? How ontologically the language divides people, if it doesn't divide them according to gender, there's already a big thing. Right? And you have a you have a biomedical system that's sort of based upon dimorphism. How does that get translated? You know? In other words, more, from the, actually more basic work, you know, more basic work. We were too eager riding on the bandwagon, I suppose, right? Because we've experienced our own conservative traditions, right? But then let's, let's sort of look back and let's sort of analyze things again, you know, and look, you look at language. So Ben's discipline is probably what we all need to try to get into. <laughs> language is important. Yes. We now have a question. Ross. Oh, yes. I would like to ask a question about the pressure a bit on the oral culture thing, because it, it seems the one thing you didn't discuss, but I'm sure you're very well aware of, is Christianity. Yes. Which is obviously not, which is both oral and written, uh, and that obviously has had a very big influence in the Philippines. Yes, very big. It but it's probably, it's... Yeah. I think Catholicism, we were not converted to Catholicism. Catholicism converted to us. <laughs> Okay, my answer to that question is an anecdote. We have the devotion of the, to the Holy Child, which is universal in the Philippines, meaning there are Holy Child parishes and fiestas north to south of the archipelago. Um, the earliest uh, festival actually uh, owes itself to the fact that Ferdinand Magellan had gifted the queen, uh, a local queen, with an image of the infant Jesus of Prague, and it still it still exists up to now, and that devotion exists in many places. Uh, a, a very famous sort of district in Manila is Tondo. It's a depressed district with a lot of poor people living there. Their patron saint is the Santo Nino or the Holy Child. My friend is um, a bakla and he lives on a street that's very near the church. And during the fiesta, the day before the actual fiesta, they will have a, a, a procession that would start around 3 p.m. and end at midnight. And the procession would wend its way all around the streets of this district. And the participants would be the different sorts of organizations and even streets and professions within 
the whole parish of Tondo. So let's say uh, the firemen would have their own, because there's a, there's a fire station, they would have their own segment of the parade where they would have their own float. The float, is it's required to have a float for each segment of the parade, and your float should have an image of the Holy Child on it. Okay? So I've, I was just... Um, well, this is the Philippines, right? So, okay, each segment of the parade is, uh, uh, the, uh, the segments are, are divided according to, to, to the street, to the profession. So the, there's a street in Tondo with a lot of gyms. So the bodybuilders have their own section. There's a, and then the basketball, the boys playing basketball have their own section. The boys play, playing basketball had the float, which was like a mini basketball court with images of the Holy Child dribbling balls and shooting. Like really like uh, with jerseys. I don't know how they have these images commissioned or made, but they're there. And then the firemen would have their float as a mini fire truck with the Holy Child uh, with fire hoses and a fireman's hat. The beauticians, the gay beauticians, had the Molan Rouge Santo Nino. It was on this big float with a lot of boas and feathers and things like that. Okay? Um, the bodybuilders had the buff Santo Nino. Um, um, what else? Um, and of course, the whole, everyone was dancing, right? It's also an occasion where uh, the bakla can have what we call booking. Basically, they can they can they can have sex. So these dancers are some of them are handsome, some of them are cute. They're like real men, right? But doesn't mean much really. Um, yeah, means a little. But you you basically just have a card, and you kind of if there's someone you fancy, you just give the card, and then later on he will text you. After the parade is done, everyone drinks, and a lot of sex takes place. So this is the sacred and the profane without any line in between, and this is a god as a child that can be dressed up like a Barbie doll and is following our desires, not the other way around. Okay, you understand the, how translational Catholicism is? Uh, that's it. I mean, you can't get any more, the more, more I can't get a clearer evidence, piece of evidence than that. I want to write about it, but then the church might get in the way and suddenly, suddenly ban it. So I don't want to write about it. Right? It was so fun, it was nice, and so much sex happening, you know, and, and, and the church might actually police it, because it becomes common knowledge, so please don't tweet about this, don't write about this, don't let this be known anywhere else, this is just for us, and for us, you know, who go to Tondo, on a pilgrimage. <laughs> no, that's just an example, right, and, and um, so yes, the Catholic faith is there, the more educated you are, and the more uh, evangelical you are, or the worse you are. So I really pity my friends who come from evangelical backgrounds. Some of them are depressive, some of them are suicidal, some of them are... Because they have been turned too literate, and they memorize passages from Leviticus, and the book of Rome, the Romans, let Paul's letter to the Romans, and all these other homophobic passages, right? But the normal Catholic does not really have to memorize much. Only a few prayers, and, and probably has to know how to uh, maybe uh, do the rituals, right? So it's more ritualistic, more oral, you know, and performative rather than doctrinal. So it's, it's also, okay, so what are the things I've learned when I have to look back on my work? First is that is there's a lot of translation that I've not taken into account. Secondly, is there's this orality that persists. And the orality needs to be theorized by all of us in Asia. We're coming from oral traditions, many of us, and we celebrate that orality, but at the same time, there are certain things about orality that we need to rethink. Like, how do you cohere as a nation? <laughs> right? How do you cohere as a nation with 176 languages, all of them oral, right? You need, you need a national imagination, and that is literate. That's the work of Ben Anderson. Print, print capitalism created the modern nations of Europe. So probably there's no alternative way around that. You can have an oral nation. Can we have an oral nation in Southeast Asia? No. Everything is constitutions and... I mean, the text, right? Text. Okay. Uh, mm, yeah. The reason, okay, I, I, the reason I've been thinking of orality and literacy is that I've been the director of the university press. And I have a bodega full of books that are not selling. Yes. Filipinos would rather go to the movies and do something oral. 
like secondary orality, movie cinema is secondary orality. If there is some literacy there, the scripts that the actors had to memorize, but that's not the final product. The product is something you will hear. So it's still orality. That's what's selling. That's what people, telenovelas are a big thing. Right? So you'd rather uh, pay for the cable, the TV cable, so that you can watch a lot of telenovelas than buy a book. Yes. And the third thing I've realized is maybe orality is the way to liberation. <laughs> Just don't write about it. Don't invent all these categories, LGBTQAII++ or whatever. Just do it. Right? There's not. There's not idea, right? The more discourse, where will this textualizing go? More and more words, more and more categories. When the idea is probably dissolved back into the speechless body that can only moan and groan and, you know, no syl and syllables, monosyllables, right? Like a child. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm just kind of rambling now, sorry, whatever. <laughs> yeah, next question. Do we have another question? I heard, I saw her hand, yes. Back to biologism, right? Uh -huh. mm. And then I was curious because you did mention about like the academic language and then the activist language. And by the way, that discussion did not happen in academic field. This is mm. something that's ongoing right now mm. in the forum. And I'm just curious, like, where, sh if you want to try to intervene in this situation, like, and we talked about like try not to debate it out, but try to go into the field and maybe like actually try to change something. But I am always like getting confused because I feel like some terms are always like misinterpreted and mm. misused, and also because all of these issues only came visible <coughs> in Korea in the last few years. So a lot of people are learning this for something as something that's new, including myself. Mm. So I don't know how to where to start like intervening or like if I see something that I generally see as ex excluding the other group rather than something that's being more inclusive. Mm. I don't know how to bridge. Well, my, my dilemma was similar in the beginning because I, I wanted to do a, 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 I wanted to write the history of sexuality in the Philippines, and so I thought it was it should be as easy as what Foucault did, which was to hit the library. And I realized the books that I wanted to read had not been written yet, <laughs> and I may need to be the one to write them. So my own book, which someone here bought, uh, chap uh, so th I found material, right, written text, but for one decade, the 80s, I, I've inserted my own biography, my own memoir, is part of it, because there's very little, there was very little I could find in that, de from that decade. It became my own memories, right? So, um, I, that's, I think, probably more unique to us, or more, more, the case for us than with Korea, which has a longer history of the script, the Buddhist script and all of that. So probably there's more literacy there that, than, than in the Philippines. We've had only literacy uh, because of public education of more than a century. The Spanish had been there earlier, but they basically kept most of us illiterate. They didn't have public education. They had a parish or parochial education only up until grade six, which meant memorizing novenas. So Spanish is really not spoken in the Philippines anymore. It, it easily disappeared when the Criollos left the country and went back to Spain. Then Spanish it became such a minority language. It's still spoken now by the very old, but very few of them, very few actually speak Spanish. But I think that what's being missed in Asia when we start using these categories is the specificity of the experiences that we're actually trying to make the category, trying to get the categories to bear. 
right? We have, we have such a wonderful plurality of experiences, and then these categories are reductions. So it would be nice if we could actually theorize in our own language, or which doesn't mean pure Korean. It could be actually mixed. Like Filipino is very mixed, right? And what happens is that we're being forced in Philippine literature and English to make everything uniform as English, and we're sacrificing the mixedness. Right, so I'm not actually any for any kind of purism here. I'm for capturing what's really on the ground, and the ground is very mixed. So probably Korea, you can be that, you can do that kind of work, which is the mixedness of it, you know. And maybe that will, in fact, represent some of that that wonderful energy that's getting sort of uh, some of uh, a lot of it is lost actually when we go for just a uniform language. Right, which is just English, you know, it can't capture everything. So make your English uh, shift now and then. We call it code shifting in the Philippines. It's supposed to be uh, uh, disallowed in the English cl classroom, but in my own English class classroom, I code shift like crazy, right? If that's the way to capture things, really. Maybe we're, maybe we're the whole planet is moving towards one language, probably, which is basically all the languages together. Maybe we're going to go get there. You know, we, we should try to experiment. So I'm all for experimentation. You understand? I'm all for that. A kind of openness, but also a rootedness at the same time, which is a kind of maybe interesting place to be. Another question, anyone? Yeah, the back. Tell us who you are first. Hi, my name is Lorenzo. Um, I'm kind of reading this talk, um, kind of as a as a Filipino, very alienated from my experience, because I feel like my entire understanding of being a gay man is rooted in English and frameworks. Um, and I get um, something that struck me in your talk was when you mentioned um, uh, woman hearted as a term, and it's something I came across recently in Filipino film criticism, because it's a trope. And um, I, I realized when I read Woman Hearted, I, I, I didn't, it didn't make sense to me, but then when I realized it meant also that it made sense to me, because yeah. that as a notion makes sense in the lab. Yeah. Um, but I, and I guess my question is more of a kind of bringing up a feeling of how a, a term like that even in its original language and context, I don't like and find problematic. Um, I guess I, I don't know how one would go about challenging ideas within the mm. Philippines and the language and the culture that I find mm. problematic and patriarchal and terrible in many senses. I think you go through the journey I went through, which was actually to disown that in the beginning. Myself, I. Why did I end up writing in English when I was bilingually educated? The option to write in Filipino was always there. The reason I chose English uh, is that uh, Filipino had only the word bakla, and it sounded so awful. It was an insult. Uh, I didn't even understand what it meant when the first time I heard it being used in the schoolyard, directed at me, and I had no idea what the word meant. Only that it was an insult and it hurt. And so um, English was something I picked up in in in, the sc in school, and I decided oh, English is a word called gay, which is gay, happy, nice, and uh, you know it opened up a whole world that Filipino could not offer to me. But then it's do you understand the journey I've taken? I went, I I rode that bus, the English bus, and then I got off, and then I rode it again. Like now, I mean, I've been speaking in English all this time, right? Do you understand that paradox? Do you understand that productive crisis that you have to be in, I think, if you have to write, continue to write in English, and yet want your writing to pertain to a reality that is actually not reducible to just any one language? Probably that's the problem of the writers in Filipino too. They're kind of puristic in that sense, right? Maybe it's the way is actually the middle ground. So I would, in your case, uh, continue on this bus that you've ridden, you've rode on, you're riding on, and see where it takes you. You know, and my journey need not be the same as yours. But what's important is that you're having these questions now. You know, and I wish I had asked these questions earlier, actually, because probably I would be much more ahead in my journey. So now I feel I have to backtrack a bit. 
and kind of do cover some more ground that I should have already covered, you know. Um, where would I have been had I had known about this translational dynamic from the beginning? Probably I would have been more sensitive and more nuanced in many of the things I had written, which I now kind of reread and I'm a little aghast. Well, yeah, aghast. Uh, and also amused, you know, and kind of I feel tenderly towards that man who wrote those things and almost want to sort of like pat him on the back or kind of rub his shoulders a bit, you know, kind of tell him it's all right, uh, things will get better. <laughs> Thank you for that, Lorenzo. It's it's it's. Uh, were you born in the Philippines? Raised in the Philippines? You grew up in Manila. So were you bilingually educated as well? My first language is English. That was spoken in the house, but you you picked up Filipino in I school. Speak Filipino. I speak a lot, um, but as you understand, it's a classic. Yeah. No. But yeah, that's the problem I've been having. When you say we have. Filipinos, my own friends, who say, my first language is, was English. Where did you pick up the language? I said, well, from the Philippines, living there, you know, watching Sesame Street, talking to my, my parents. So it's a Philippine English. <laughs> Do you understand that? It's not American English. So it is our English. It's as Filipino as Filipino, actually. It just doesn't feel it for us, right? But if you talk to Americans, they're, they're going to hear it. We don't hear it, actually. What's nice is this. If we turn much of what we do oral into oral audio works, then there may not no, may be no need to keep reminding ourselves of the specificity of the Anglophone context where we come from. Because on the page, that specificity disappears. But when I hear you say it, it's so clear. You understand? Like, Lorenzo, you sounded Filipino the whole time to me. See? So no problem there. But that's it, right? That we bring that specificity in that in the intonation, in the phrasing, etc. Those things disappear on the page. So maybe this is already my thought, because people are my students are becoming less and less literate in the print sense and more and more literate in the audiovisual sense. Maybe this maybe someday somewhere down the line uh, my my students will submit this, their final papers as videos. Why not? Right? They're doing it now. We have, I've been, I'm a publisher, so I'm interested in promoting book reviews. There are book reviews that are YouTube videos. And they are, they are, they are getting so many hits, and people are being affected by how, how people, I think Oprah Winfrey and the book club and all of that, everyone wants to be sort of like seen on camera. That's one, but at the same time, it's just better than actually writing it, which is, you know, if you're lazy, but just talking about it might be better. So that's it. We're going to hear the Englishes of the world, you know, and then we're going to see how English is not just in one context, but in many. And all those Englishes are, are carrying all sorts of translational baggage, right? That probably if you're... And that's the thing I didn't get to pursue a lot in my presentation, no time, is I am a little more indulgent of, crit, of creative writers in English than critics in English. Because I think creative writing... Uh, um, doesn't have to be self-reflexive all the time. I mean, you're right, right? See, I'm a little schizophrenic. I do both. I write poetry in, poetry in, in the morning and at night I do theory. I've split my, myself that way. But if you're a critic and doing theory, this is where you have to be aware of your own presuppositions. But writers need not be aware of those presuppositions, right? So uh, a, a, a novel by a writer in English in the Philippines may be committing all these mistranslations because he was not aware. Then the critic will be the one to point those out. But that very same critic cannot commit mistranslations because he, what, uh, what use is he being a critic, right? Or a theorist if he cannot be that sort of self-critical, okay? So is that fair? I think, for to spare writers and to just expect more from critics. No? We have so much to do. Getting tenure is hard enough. Huh? Hmm? How can you possibly avoid mistranslations on all sides? It's impossible. It's impossible, yes. But yes, it's impossible. But I'm, I'm thinking, it may be possible once we start thinking of a language that does not, once we start inventing our idea of critical language, and starting again, you know, maybe. But to get tenure and all of that, you have to, yeah, I understand. 
So uh, forget my presentation. It's useless. <laughs> Let's all get our tenure. <laughs> No, but you understand, it's a personal paper. I mean, I didn't know what else to say or do because suddenly I got in. When I said yes to this invitation, I thought I was going to speak to my friend's class because, you know, Tina Juan invited me. And then I, and then the next thing I knew, she, she sent me the invitation to the program and I was a speaker at the very end of it, of this conference. And I, I was horrified. And he said, oh, yeah, 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 what are you talking about? And then, of course, good thing I had seen this film that I really liked, you know, because it was... It was resolutely local. Uh, you had an upper middle class character who's actually m racially mixed, but she's hardly talking in English. And everyone else speaks, you know, rooted language, vernacular, you know, local expressions, right? And um, it's oblivious to activist discourse. It's so incorrect, the lesbian complying with a reproductive imperative, you know? It's so incorrect, right? But it makes you think of translation, right? And it makes you think of, and then in the end, it has the same trajectory towards modernity, right? But then in the end, it tweaks it too, because, you know, she does not turn into a lipstick lesbian, unlike gay, the bakla turning masculine, like in the novel, okay? So there's that. So there are, you know, interesting things happening in cinema in the Philippines. And I hope you have a Filipino film in your festival. Okay, yes, yes. All right. Maybe in the end, so maybe I should just turn into a creative writer, you know. Yeah. You know, but to come to think of it, because I'm in London, I'm here in the UK again. Back in 1999, this was before we met, or maybe a little after. Before. Before, like almost a decade before. There was a conference in Manchester that I got invited to, and it was a very big conference with people like... Um, like big names doing work in sexuality studies, like Gilbert Hurt, you know, and uh, all these big names, right? They all had keynotes, and they did these theory, omnibus theory reflections, right? It was such a big conference, and all of us delivering papers in the parallel sessions were reduced to uh, na native informants, giving our, our, our bits of data, you know, and only they had the right to do the theory, I was upset, and my, my panel, the parallel one, was at the very end of it. So, what did I do? I rewrote my paper. I peppered it with so many Filipino words that I didn't translate that it did not communicate. Already then, I think, looking back, I understood the power of the untranslatable, you know? And how the limit of theory is the untranslatable. The limit of theory, which is generality, is the specific, the very, very specific, the un irreducibly specific, right? Yes. And so, well, I don't think anyone else understood my paper, <laughs> just myself. I didn't mind, you know, I think, and in the end I thought, you know, I, I was happy with what I did. It was a theoretical point I was making that no one understood except me. Uh, Yes. But now I, I did, I translated a lot for you guys, and I said it somewhere that all of these foregoing sentences in English miss so much, you know, and I know that, you know, for a fact. Film cannot miss because it's, or it misses, but then it's just, you are not shown propositional statements. You're given images, right? And the images contain ideas, and they cannot be reduced to one thing. So maybe art is it, right? Maybe we should art, make art do the theory. Back to Trintin Minha, you know? And that kind of hybrid space between creativity and theory. Probably another kind of realization. Number five, I better write that down. <laughs> so I'll forget. So stick to art. Stick um, to creative writing. Yeah. <laughs> With that, okay, you thank you so much, Ben. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, it's, been, it's been a great pleasure. It's been a wonderful end to two days of, of discussion, so thank you. Thank you very much.